Uh, many of you know Laurie. Laurie is an associate professor here in computer science and engineering and public policy, and also a director of uh, CUPS, the Scilab Usable Privacy and Security Laboratory. Uh, it's a uh, measure of uh, Laurie's success and the impact of her work that CMU is considered one of the places for research in uh, usable security and privacy, and that's really largely to, due to Laurie's uh, efforts. So, Laurie. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to be speaking today about um, some work that I've done with a whole bunch of collaborators. Um, uh, these are uh, collaborators here at Carnegie Mellon, including uh, Christian Bravo Lillo, Julie Downs, Soranga Komanduri, and Manya Sleeper, as well as two um, of our collaborators at Microsoft, Rob Reeder and Stuart Schechter. <coughs> Okay, the work that we're doing here um, is related to computer security warnings. And I'm sure you've all seen many warnings that look kind of like this. And you know exactly what they all say, because they all say the same thing. And the problem with these warnings is obviously that nobody reads them. They just assume that they say the same thing and aren't worth their time. Um, and so we've had a research project here for uh, several years now where we're trying to figure out how we can improve these computer security dialogues. Um, these dialogues are pretty common. Um, they appear in operating system software and application software in a variety of different places where the user is not really thinking about security. And so when the user is going about their normal tasks, when they're downloading software, installing, running software, um, running macros, uh, authenticating, uh, the, they get prompted with these warning dialogues and asked to make a decision. Um, so in order to try to improve the situation, we need to observe users interacting with these dialogues. Um, and we can't just invite the users into our lab and show them a dialogue and say, hey, what do you think? We need to actually uh, observe them using these dialogues kind of in their natural environment um, as they would appear when the user is generally doing something else and not really thinking about security. It's fairly diff difficult to run these sorts of experiments. And we, we have uh, tried many different ways to run them over the past several years. Um, we've done some where we've actually done interviews and surveys, where we bring users into our lab and we put them in hypothetical situations. And we say, so let's say your friend calls you up and they say, I've got this dialogue on my screen and I don't know what to do. What would you tell them? Um, and we've gotten some useful data that way. Um, but it's not the same thing as when it actually happens to somebody. Uh, we've also done some laboratory studies where we've used deception in order to put people in a somewhat natural situation. Um, so we'll bring them into the lab, we'll give them tasks that have nothing to do with security, and in the middle of those tasks, for example, an online shopping task, they might get some kind of a warning will pop up, um, and the participant assumes, we hope, that the warning is, is nothing to do with our study, it's just something that happened, and we can see how they react to that. Um, now, there are some downsides to doing these sorts of studies um, in a lab environment. For example, even though the participants don't associate the warning with our study, they, they know that they're in a lab and they feel very safe. They don't think that Carnegie Mellon researchers are going to hurt them in a study or ask them to do something unsafe, and so they don't feel they need to respond to a warning. They also <clears throat> know that they're um, not using their own computers. They're using our computers, so they care a lot less about breaking it than if it was their own computer. And then also, since we're doing it in a lab, and each person who uh, participates has to actually physically walk to, over to our lab and spend an hour or so in the lab, it's hard to do a large number of participants in this sort of study. So we've moved on, and in addition to doing these lab studies, we're now trying to do studies that are online and, um, and use deception in an online study. And so I'm going to tell you about um, the uh, infrastructure that we've built in order to facilitate these studies and about two of the studies that we've conducted um, in this way. So what are our requirements for doing this sort of study? We need a way that we can observe a large number of participants, and we're talking hundreds or thousands of participants, as opposed to the uh, dozens that we can accommodate in a lab study. Uh, we need to be able to do this remotely. 
Um, we need to observe participants interacting with operating system dialogues. Um, we need to be able to make small changes to these dialogues and see what happens. We need to have participants doing tasks that are unrelated to security when these dialogues pop up. And we need to be able to ask participants questions afterwards so we can um, have them reflect on what happened and help us understand why, th why they behaved in the way they did. So we developed an online game evaluation platform. Uh, so to the participants in our study, they believe they're coming uh, to our website to do a study on online games. Um, in reality, though, they're doing a study about um, security warnings. And so what we're able to do is have them uh, go, go to a website to play online games. And in the process, these warning dialogues are going to pop up. We run this, these studies over Amazon's Mechanical Turk, uh, which is a crowdsourcing system that allows us to advertise um, a study, for, uh, recruit people to participate. We can pay them a small amount of money, uh, 10 cents, a dollar, depends on the length of the study. Um, Amazon handles all the payments. We don't have to collect any personally identifiable information from the participant. Uh, they can do the study and get paid, and we get our data. Um, we, we can design the study so that we have many different conditions or treatments within the study. So we can have, you know, 10 different permutations of an interface and we can have 100 or 200 or 1,000 people try each permut permutation. Uh, we've also uh, instrumented our infrastructure so that as our subjects interact with our warnings, we know exactly where they're moving their mouse and where they're clicking and what they're typing in and the timing of all of these events. Um, we have also have it set up so that once they have finished uh, with the, uh, the game study or what they think they're doing, we can then give them a survey and ask them questions about uh, the experience. And then we have a dashboard where we can actually look at every participant who's gone through our study and we can replay all of their clicks and typing and mouse movements and see exactly how they move through our interface. So let me show you what this looks like, um, how a user would experience our studies. So a user would go on to Mechanical Turk, where they see a list of studies or, um, or uh, uh, tasks that they might participate in. And um, here they, they can see um, our online game evaluation study, and they can uh, click there in order to check it out. Here they're given um, the requirements for doing the study, um, and uh, they see that it's a Carnegie Mellon study and it's about online games, and they're going to get paid a dollar for their participation. Um, they can scroll down to the bottom to get more information, accept the hit, um, and then they're given this URL, um, and they go there in order to do the study. So they click on the URL, and um, now they're on our website for the online game evaluation study. They click Next. They get our um, consent form, which uh, the IRB requires that we have um, our subjects give consent for human subject studies, so they can read through that. They have to um, indicate that they're over 18, they've read the information, they want to participate, they give their consent to go ahead. So now they're on the first uh, page of the online game evaluation. And here they are shown some instructions. Um, they're told that they should uh, go to the game website, they should play it for two to three minutes, and then they should return to the survey to answer some questions. Um, we also let them know that the game website is not controlled by us, um, and it's, it's external to the study. Um, and we, we tell them this so that they don't feel like, oh, this is just a Carnegie Mellon game, this is a safe environment. We want them to understand that this is a, they're going somewhere else um, in order to play the game. So then they can click on the link. This one is for uh, GameTop.com, and uh, they're going to play the Mars Buggy online game. So they go there, click New Game. They have to drive this little Mars Buggy around and pick things up and get points. And then when they're done, they go to the survey. And the survey asks them a few questions about the game. Um, they're asked, were you able to play the game? And of course, here they say yes. And they ask them to, we ask them to describe the game. They say it's a buggy on Mars has to collect astronauts. OK, then we ask them um, some questions about the game. Have you played it before? No. Do you think it was fun? Yes. Um, and we asked them a bunch of other questions, um, which we don't actually care about, but they're to, to get the, make them feel like they're evaluating games. Um, when they're done with that, 
we then say, okay, it's time to evaluate the next game. And so now uh, this person is going to evaluate the Tom and Jerry refrigerator raid game. And they go there, and now they have to move this little mouse around the screen and drop things on the cat or something like that. Um, and now our user is going to uh, fill out the evaluation, and this time they say it's a boring Tom and Jerry game, maybe fun for kids. Um, and uh, they go through, they answer the same questions. Now we get to the third game. And uh, this time they click on the link um, and they go to yourgamefactory.net. And it tells them this game requires the latest version of Microsoft Silverlight. Silverlight is either missing or out of date. And um, uh, the, uh, the little wheel in the middle um, is turning and they wait for the game to be prepared. After a few seconds, something pops up on their screen. And it says, do you allow the following program to make changes to this computer? And it's Microsoft Silverlight. Um, and there's a place for them to enter their username and password here um, in order to install Microsoft Silverlight onto their computer. Okay, uh, once they've uh, uh, gone ahead and entered their username and password. It says it's installing or updating Silverlight. Um, and then uh, they, after they've done all that, it tells them that this game has been removed due to user complaints. So they don't actually ever get to play the game. So sad. Um, Okay, so uh, then uh, we tell them the installation update was canceled by the user and we take them back to the survey. So now when we ask them, were you able to play the game? They say no, and we ask them why not. And this person says, I tried to install Silverlight, but it won't install on my computer. Okay, so uh, then they go on to the rest of the uh, survey. And this is where we start asking them about warnings and uh, password entry. So uh, the first question we ask them is whether they've encountered any requests to enter a password while they were doing the study. Um, they should all say yes. Um, and we asked them what program or website requested your password. Uh, here we got some interesting answers, uh, in this case, Silverlight. Um, then we asked them some questions uh, to try to understand whether they were on to us um, or whether they really believed that they were entering their password um, in order to install the software. Right? So we tell them, you entered eight characters into the password field of the dialog box. Um, this password you entered is stored in your browser, but we have not sent your password to our servers. Was the password you entered a real password for an account on your computer? And then we tell them that if you say yes, we'll immediately delete any records of the password. And if you say no, um, we, we don't commit to, to uh, deleting that. Right? So if the person says no, I did not en enter a genuine password, then we double check with them and we, we uh, tell them, since you did not enter a genuine password, may we collect the contents, contents of the field for analysis. Right, so what we're trying to do here is to get them to say, you know, if, it was, if they really fell for it and entered their real password, we want them to admit that. Um, and so we tried to word the question in such a way that they're, they're going to want to admit it because they're going to want us to delete the password and not send it to our servers. Okay, um, we also, um, uh, want to know uh, whether they were at all suspicious about what was going on. Um, so we go ahead and we tell them that we were mimicking the windows from um, our browser to collect data on how you respond to the window. Okay, and then we, we ask them, did you know that the password entry window was actually mimicked by the website and not a real password request from your operating system? Right, and we gave them a few different choices uh, that they could indicate here. All right. We also then went on and asked them some questions about themselves. Um, we asked them about whether they have antivirus software in their computer. We asked them um, about their technical expertise. Um, we asked them gender, age, um, things like that. Um, we, we then threw in a question to just see if they were paying attention. We asked them, um, the power switch on a computer is used to fill in the blank, uh, multiple choice here. Um, so that was just to find out if they're paying attention. Um, and then we asked them a bunch of technical questions, multiple choice, so that we could get an assessment of their level of security expertise. All right, finally, they get to the end. We tell them you finished the survey and we give them a code which they can enter back into Mechanical Turk in order to get paid. Um, and then we give them a debrief where we explain to them what happened here. And this is required by the IRB because this was a deceptive study. Okay, so then they go back to Mechanical Turk, they enter in their code and submit, and they're done. Right, so that's the experience um, of a participant. Uh, it will take a participant about 20 minutes to go through that. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about two studies that we did that used that infrastructure. Um, so the first one uh, is on web-based spoof spoofing attacks on OS password entry dialogue. So pretty much the sequence that I just showed you. And then the second one um, is about uh, security decision user interface design. Okay, so the first uh, paper um, was actually presented just last week um, by Christian at uh, the CCS conference. All right, the motivation of this study was to explore the trusted path problem. Um, so uh, operating systems will present uh, dialog boxes to users to get them to type in their password. And if it is a real uh, uh, dialog box presented by the operating system, you should trust it and, and enter your password in order to do things on your computer. Um, but if it's not really provided by your operating system, you should not be typing in your password because you'll be giving your password to an attacker. So what we want to know is how do users actually tell the difference? How do they know that they're really typing in their password for the operating system? Now, this is an important problem because if an attacker can get you to type in your password um, and, and give it to them, there's all sorts of things that they can do. They can install or run malicious software on your computer. They can actually change the settings on your computer and maybe turn off some of the security features to give them access to more things on your computer. Um, and they can get your password, and that password might be uh, used not only on your desktop computer or laptop or whatever, but at other places as well. And so it's useful for the attacker to have your password. Now, Windows has a number of defenses that are supposed to help prevent people from falling for this sort of attack. Um, and so users are taught not to enter, the, enter your password without hitting Control-Alt-Delete. Um, of course, there are times when you're prompted by your operating system to enter your password when you didn't hit Control-Alt-Delete. So this is not um, a perfect uh, defense. Um, Windows also sometimes dims the screen outside the dialog box before you enter a password. And so you're supposed to notice, ah, the screen is dimmed. It's safe to enter my password. Unfortunately, there's also situations where that doesn't happen. And, um, and even, even when it does happen, it seems that users um, haven't really noticed that this is what goes on. And as you'll see uh, from, from our results, um, we did not actually spoof this part of the operating system. Um, you, you may have noticed um, in the sequence that I showed you, when the password box popped up, nothing dimmed on the screen. And yet, um, as you'll see, many people fell for it anyway. Right, so our main research question is what proportion of users would enter their password in a spoofed OS window? Um, so we, we want to understand uh, how, how difficult is it for users to, to make this distinction. We have eight different conditions that we tested. Um, the first four conditions uh, look are, are designed to, um, to spoof a number of different dialogues in um, Windows and Microsoft. We have two different password entry dialogues um, that, that do show up in Windows in different situations. Those are the two on the left. Um, and then we wanted to compare this to what happens um, on, on Mac OS. Uh, the problem is that while in Windows you have one dialog that pops up and it asks for your password and you're done, on the Mac you actually have a whole series of dialogs. And so it's actually a somewhat different experience. Um, so we, uh, we ended up um, spoofing it in two different ways. Um, the one that you see over here uh, starts the way a typical Macintosh installation dialog begins, where you are given some configuration options. And then on the next screen, you are given the opportunity to enter your password and install it. Um, the one on the right, we just jump directly to the password entry dialog. So we expect that some Mac users probably didn't fall for this because they, when they saw the password entry without having gone through the configuration, they said, oh, wait a minute, this, this isn't normal. This isn't how I normally do things on a Mac, and so that may have tipped them off. Okay, we also had another four, four conditions, and what we did in these four conditions is that we disabled all of the cancel buttons in the dialog. So I circled in red the places where you can normally cancel the dialog. So when it pops up, instead of entering your password, you could actually close the window and say, hey, I'm not giving you my password. Um, with cancel disabled, there's no way to do that. And so now the only way to get out of it is just to close your browser window. And so uh, a user who was suspicious here could have closed their browser window and gone back to the survey and just said, you know, I, I wasn't able to play this game. Okay, so this uh, study uh, posed a number of challenges for us in trying to figure out what really happened. 
Um, so we wanted to know which participants actually detected that we were spoofing them. Um, and, uh, and so that's why we had to ask um, some of the questions like I showed you before so that we could uh, try to figure out whether people were fooled. Of course, it's difficult to get people to admit it. Um, we also wanted to know which participants actually entered real passwords and which ones may have entered fake passwords in order to kind of test the system and see what would happen. Um, so uh, one of the uh, questions that we asked them was to, was to indicate which of the following factors contributed to their decision of not entering your password. So if we have somebody who, who did not enter a password, um, proceeded through without entering it, we want to know, did they not enter a password because they were lazy, they didn't feel like installing software in their computer, they didn't know what to do, or were they really suspicious of what was going on? And so we did ask them a number of questions to try to um, zero in on exactly why it was they didn't enter their password. Um, the the, the uh, correct answer for somebody who was suspicious would have been something like, I thought that the password entry window was trying to steal my password. Um, Okay, and I already showed you the sequence of what we asked them in order to get them to admit um, whether they had entered their real password or not. Okay, so once we had collected all our data, um, what we wanted to do first was to divide up our participants and understand um, what, what had happened as they'd gone through the experiment. Right, so we had one set of participants that we call unexposed. And these are people who, for whatever reason, never actually saw the password entry dialog. Um, it may be because they actually didn't bother clicking on the link to go play the game. They thought they were going to fill out the survey without playing the game, you know, get, get done with it fast. Um, it may be that there was something that wasn't working in their browser. There are a number of different reasons. Um, but if they didn't see the actual password entry dialog, then we can't get any useful data out of them. And so that's the unexposed group group and we're not going to consider them further. Um, next we have um, the people who saw the dialogue and so the question is did they actually enter a password and if they did was it real? So the group that entered a real password we consider compromised. Had this been real they, they would have been compromised by the attack. Right. Then we had a group of people who did not enter their password um, but when we asked them why they didn't enter, an, enter it, their answer had nothing to do with being suspicious about passwords. And so we call that group oblivious. You know, they, they didn't enter their password because you know, they were in a rush or they didn't feel like installing software. Um, but maybe had they been a little bit less in a hurry or uh, you know, less lazy, they would have just gone ahead and, answered, and entered their password. Um, and so this group is at risk um, and could have fallen for an attack. Then we have the group that we call the wise group. Um, and these are the people who either entered a password but entered a fake password, um, or who didn't enter a password because they were onto us. They, they realized that there was something suspicious going on here. And so this is the group that is going to be least likely to fall for a future attack. All right, so we had 504 exposed participants in our study across 11 different conditions. Um, they, they uh, were average age was 28 years old, um, about 55% male, 78% Caucasian, uh, and it took about 17 and a half minutes for them to complete the study. We then did a follow-up experiment um, with just uh, one of our conditions, and there we had um, about 200 participants and, and very similar demographics. Okay, so let's take a look at, um, at our conditions and how people did. Um, so here I'm showing you in yellow the percentage of people who were wise to the attack in each of these conditions. Um, you'll notice that across all of the conditions, we have about a third of the people who are, who are wise to the attack. Then we look at who was oblivious to the attack. Um, and here you see we have an actually even larger group that was oblivious to the attack. And uh, this varies a little bit more by condition. Then we have the compromise group, and this is the group that we really care about here. Um, and the, these are the people, had this been real, would have been compromised. Um, and you can see that in our Windows conditions, we have somewhere around 25% of people who uh, would have been compromised by the attack. Um, now, the numbers are much lower in our Mac conditions, um, but as, as you may recall, our Mac conditions were not nearly as faithful a spoof as our Windows conditions. Um, so these really are not comparable numbers. Um, 
And we think that it's likely that had we more faithfully spoofed the MAC conditions that we may have had more people fall for those as well. Um, in our uh, follow-up, where we, where we just took, uh, took one of our conditions and we had 200 people um, go through it so that we could get a larger sample size, um, we found here that, um, that about 20% of our participants were compromised. And when we calcula calculate the 95% uh, confidence intervals, it tells us that basically between 15 and 26% of people would probably be compromised uh, in this condition. All right, so that's how our study worked. Um, there were some limitations to doing a study this way. Um, for one thing, when, when a person dropped out of the study and didn't actually go through and answer all our survey questions, um, we, we have no way of knowing exactly what happened to them. And it's possible that some of those people who dropped out, dropped out because they were wise to what was going on. And so maybe that's inflating some of our numbers. Um, we actually went through and tried to get some more information to figure out how much of a risk that was. Um, we found that a lot of the people who dropped out, so 105 out of the 136 who dropped out, actually were never exposed to the warning. So they dropped out for whatever reasons they had um, before the password entry dialog popped up. And so we're not too concerned about them. Um, we have 25 of them who were not really sure whether or not they, they actually were exposed or not for various reasons. Um, we only have six who we know actually were exposed and then dropped out. Okay, And so of the 136 dropouts, there's only six that we're convinced actually were wise and that's why they dropped out. And we saw a similar pattern in, in the follow-up study. Um, so we think that, that while we may have lost some wise participants, it doesn't seem to be overwhelming numbers of them. Um, there were another, another number of other problems uh, uh, that we encountered. Um, some of the ways that we actually spoofed the dialogues um, were not um, were not completely true to, to how how they actually occur. Um, for example, the no screen dimming and the simplified max sequence. And there were a number of um, minor wording differences, some of which um, were on purpose, and many of which were were mistakes that we noticed later. Um, but despite these limitations, uh, we think that this study g gets us pretty close to observing what would actually happen. Um, and so uh, we conclude from this study that we, we've demonstrated that spoofing, spoofing OS credentials in Windows is effective. Um, and it's actually a pretty important attack. Um, we think that at least 15% of people would be likely to fall for this attack. Um, and if you compare that to other attacks, for example, fake antivirus attacks, this is, these numbers are actually much higher. Um, we've seen reported that somewhere between 5 and 8% of people fall for fake antivirus and uh, fake antivirus attacks and actually install malware as a result. Um, and so if uh, attackers start doing attacks like this, this could potentially be much worse than the fake AV attacks. Um, we also observed that um, if an attacker you know, really wanted to make these attacks work, they could, do, they could go a lot further than we actually went. Um, and an attacker, you know, it, it's their, their business to try to make these things as good as possible. And so they could use some either even better um, uh, ruses than what we actually used. Um, you know, we found that a lot of people didn't want to enter their password because they didn't feel like installing software. Um, so if they could come up with some, some uh, reason to convince users that it was really important to install software, uh, then they'd likely get a lot more people to fall for it. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the second study, um, and this one is about designing security decision user interfaces for users who are, who are habituated to ignoring them. Um, and this is um, a paper that is still under review, and so this is work that we finished fairly recently. Okay, the motivation for this study is that users have become habituated to ignoring the security warning dialogues. They see them and they slap them away like with a fly swatter. Um, and so what we want to know is how we can build a better warning dialogue that will get users to pay attention. So we've gone to the literature to try to uh, get some insights into designing warning dialogues. And so warning science um, has a lot that, that we can learn from. Um, there's a whole big handbook of warnings um, that looks at how people process information and warnings, um, such as railroad crossing signs and the labels on medicine bottles. And they have a whole cognitive model that they've developed about how people process warnings. And so this has been very informative as we have looked at warning design. Um, 
One of the things that we learn from warning science is the mechanisms that warnings use to protect people from harm. So a warning will, will serve the function of alerting, alerting somebody to the presence of a hazard. Um, so you know, if there's a hole in the road, you have a sign that tells you there's a hole in the road that you might not have seen if the sign wasn't there. Um, they also provide information to help people make informed decisions. And so it may be that you need some information in order to understand the best course of action to avoid a hazard. Um, they also can help influence uh, people <clears throat> or modify their behavior. Um, <clears throat> and finally, uh, warnings can, can help remind people who already know about a hazard. Um, we all know that we shouldn't stick our fingers into machines. We know that that's dangerous. But when you see that warning sign telling you not to stick your finger in the machine, it reminds you, oh, yes, let me back up a little bit. Um, so these, these are all good uses of warnings. Um, but one of the things that is really emphasized in the warning science literature is that actually warning should be a last resort. So it's kind of interesting. You read this whole big book about warnings, and the punchline is don't use warnings. You really only use them if you have to. Really, we want to get rid of the hazards rather than using warnings. So let me show you a physical example um, to understand you know, why we shouldn't uh, use warnings. Um, so this is a hazard. Uh, this is a hazardous sidewalk um, that used to be in front of my house. And uh, the city of Pittsburgh informed me that it was a hazard and I needed to remove the hazard. Right? So the best solution was, in fact, remove the hazard. And this is what I did. And now I have a nice, smooth sidewalk in front of my house. Um, but I couldn't immediately remove the hazard when the city informed me about it because um, they sent me a notice about it in January and there was snow on the ground. Okay, So what can I do in the meantime before I can get around to removing the hazard? Well, I can guard against it. Right? So you know, I can post a guard. I can put up uh, cones. Um, this picture, um, uh, perhaps obviously or not, is photoshopped, um, but this is what some of my neighbors actually did. Um, they, they actually put out hazard cones and they, they um, locked them to the tree so that they didn't disappear. Right? And so in this way, they were hoping that people would see the tripping hazard and would not trip over the sidewalk. Um, now, cones and locking them to a tree, that may be a little bit extreme. Um, and so maybe all we really need to do is just post a warning so that people don't trip over the sidewalk. So we could do something like this. Um, now, obviously, there, there are some uh, problems with this warning, because if I'm looking down and I see the sign, then I probably also see that the sidewalk is broken, and I'm not so likely to trip over it. Um, and once again, this is Photoshop, but this is what my neighbors did. Um, and so, you know, people really are posting these warnings rather than removing the hazards. Uh, and that's a problem. And it seems to be an especial, uh, especially big problem in computer security, where we have a lot of situations where we have software that detects something that's a potential hazard, and it warns the user about it instead of fixing the problem, removing the hazard, you know, sandboxing something, do, doing any number of things that might be done in order to actually protect the user. Um, and it turns out that often when these warnings appear, that, that it turns out that there isn't actually a hazard or that it's not really going to hurt the user. Um, and so users get habituated to ignoring the warnings. I can swat them away and nothing bad happened. And I've done it a hundred times and nothing bad ever happened. And so from this, I have learned that nothing bad ever will happen. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes there actually is a hazard and something bad might actually happen. But at that point, I'm not paying any attention and so the warning is not going to be helpful. A few years ago, we did a study here at Carnegie Mellon um, looking at browser certificate warnings. And these are some of the most insidious warnings because they appear so frequently in web browsers where you have a, you have a certificate that's expired or mismatched or something like that, self-signed certificate. Um, and in the vast majority of these cases, there's nothing dangerous going on. Um, but in some cases, they, there is a dangerous situation. And so um, it, uh, we can't just say, tell users, well, always ignore these warnings because there are some cases where they will get hurt. Uh, so we did a lab study um, where we had people, um, it was a deceptive study, we had people go and do a number of tasks and when they went to the Carnegie Mellon Library and when they went to the bank where they had a bank account and were going to uh, check their account balance, in both of those cases, a warning popped up in their browser saying that there was a bad certificate. 
Um, and we wanted to see what they would do in those situations. Now, we expected that the Carnegie Mellon Library, having a bad certificate, they probably wouldn't really care. And they probably really didn't need to care at that point um, because they weren't going to actually enter any personal information at the Carnegie Mellon Library. But when they were logging into their online bank account, they should care if they're getting this warning that they've never seen before at their banking website because it might mean that there is um, some sort of a man in the middle attack. So we tested this with um, five different web browsers and their warnings. Um, we found that with IE7, 90% of the people fell for it. And so they ignored the warning at, at their bank website. With Firefox 2, 90% of the people fell for it. With Firefox 3, only 50% fell for it. However, Firefox 3 had just come out when we did the study, and um, it had a kind of convoluted sequence of things you had to do in order to ignore the warning. And we had a number of users who tried really hard to ignore the warning, and they just couldn't figure out how to do it yet. Um, and so that's why only 50% of those fell. But I, I suspect had we done the study like two months later, we would have had 90%, because by then they would have learned how to actually disable the warning. Um, we had two different custom interfaces, and I'm showing you one of them there in the red box. And there we had 45% or 60% um, uh, who, who uh, ignored the warning. So as you can see, our custom warnings were a big improvement. And you know, in some ways you say, wow, look, you know, we saved half the people. That, that's a great improvement. Um, but we didn't celebrate because, well, we still had more than 50% of our participants who ignored even our really good warnings. Um, and um, even worse, as we observed them in the lab using these warnings, we saw that habituation was still a problem even in our new improved warnings. In fact, when they saw them multiple times, already on the second time they saw it, they stopped, they stopped reading it and they stopped looking at it and they said, oh, it's that again. And they were just ready to ignore it. Um, so that was uh, kind of depressing. Um, and we've been thinking ever since about how can we improve warnings. Um, and clearly, if we can find ways to remove the hazards and not have to have warnings, as I mentioned before, we're going to be in a much better situation. Um, one of the ways that we may be able to do this is to have the software do a lot more behind the scenes in trying to figure out uh, whether this is actually a dangerous situation or not. So we don't need to warn about every certificate. And there are, there are a number of different um, uh, systems that people have proposed where we can actually have some intelligence about the bad certificates to see, is this a bad certificate that everybody has seen you know, for the past several months and we know that it's not dangerous, or is this a new one that nobody's ever seen before? And that really changes the situation. The other thing that we can do is to try to redesign the warnings in a way that's be going to better support users. Now, one of the things that makes this particularly complicated for computer security is that computer security warnings um, are not really straightforward warnings. So if you see a warning sign on a bottle of poison and it tells you not to drink it, right, it's always dangerous to drink poison. You should never, ever drink poison. There is no situation you should drink poison, I guess, unless you want to kill yourself, right? Um, wine, on the other hand, also has warnings on it. But the warnings on wise, wine are context dependent. So the warnings on wine will tell you not to drink wine if you're about to go drive a car or not to drink wine if you're pregnant, right? And so you have to make a judgment. Am I about to go drive a car or am I pregnant? And you can decide whether or not it's safe for you to drink wine right now. And with security warning dialogues, they're more like the wine warning than the poison warning. And so we have this um, context dependence and we have a judgment that the user needs to make. Unfortunately, the judgments that the user needs to make are not quite as simple as, am I about to go drive a car or am I pregnant? They're things that people may not be able to figure out so easily. Okay, here's some examples of some real warnings from um, Windows that, um, that are related to file installation. Um, so uh, this one says, do you want to allow the following program to make changes to this computer? Yes or no? And you know, how is a user supposed to decide? It doesn't give you any information that explains to you, you know, how can I determine whether I should allow this sort of thing? Um, it does actually give you here some information about the publisher, but it doesn't explain to a user how they should use that information in order to make a decision. 
Um, here's another one, um, and this one has a little bit more information. And if you actually read through the, the, the print here, it says, if you receive this program as an unexpected solicitation, link, or attachment, it might be an attempt to fool you. We recommend that you delete it. Right, so this gives me some more information and it might help me make the decision, but that information is somewhat buried um, among the other text on the screen. And there's actually some other useful information there, but again, um, no, no uh, uh, pointers to help the user know what they should do with it. So for, the, for this study, we decided to use uh, the same ruse that we used in the operating system spoof study. Uh, but this time, we were not give, asking people to um, type in a password. We just were, um, we were just giving them a software installation dialog to install Microsoft Sil Silverlight. Um, we made up some simplified installation dialogs, um, and we made them simple so that we could actually isolate some, some of the variables that we were interested in. Um, and we had nine variants of the software the simple software installation dialogue. And they were all designed to focus on whether we could attract users' attention to the key information they would need to make a decision about whether or not to install software. Okay, so here are um, the control treatments that we used in this study. And uh, take a look at these. Um, raise your hand if you can spot which one is the suspicious software. Okay, so hopefully you all can see that it has to do with the publisher, right? So we had two scenarios that we used in this study. One was we called our benign scenario, where the, where the software is from Microsoft Corporation. The other one is the suspicious scenario, where the software is from Microsoft spelled in a very interesting way. Uh, corporation. Um, if this is the only information that you have, then the only way you can make the decision really is based on that publisher line. There, there's nothing else that you would have um, to go on. Now, if, if this had really happened to you, there might be more you would have to go on based on the context of when you downloaded the software or whatever. Um, but in the abstract, this is really the best information that you have to go on. And so the key question um, that a person seeing this dialogue should be asking is whether or not they trust the publisher. Um, and in fact, in this sort of situation, if it's a well-known publisher or if you've like specifically gone to the website of a publisher in order to download something, then if the name matches what you're expecting, it's usually safe to go ahead and trust that publisher. Not always, but usually. Right. So how can we get users to notice suspicious publishers? And we came up with a bunch of different ways that we might do that. Um, one, one way is that we might make the dialogue options really short and simple so that there's not a lot for people to read. Um, another way is that we might tell them that their antivirus program doesn't recognize the software. Maybe that will get their attention if they're relying on the fact that, oh, my antivirus software would tell me if this was suspicious. Um, so we should tell them, oh, this is too new. Your, your antivirus software doesn't know whether this is good or bad. Um, maybe we should attract attention to the publisher's name. Um, maybe we should force a delay so that people have to sit there and look at it a little bit before they can swat it away. Maybe we should force the users to take some sort of an action before they can install the software. Or maybe we should force them to actually read the publisher's name. Now, forcing someone to read something turns out to be fairly difficult to do, but we think we came up with a way to do it. Okay, so here's what our conditions looked like. Um, we had our short options condition um, where instead of saying, I do not trust this publisher, cancel the installation, it just says cancel the installation. So this was the, the short and sweet version. Um, here's our no antivirus condition, which says the software program or update is too new to be recognized by antivirus software. Here's our ANSI condition where we um, took the publisher name and we put it in this really garish looking black and yellow and red box. Um, then we had a request position. So in, in this condition, um, when the user tries to click on the install the software button, this pops up and it says, please make sure you read the publisher before choosing this option. Okay, so it's very polite. Please do this. Um, then uh, we have a, a condition where we had some animation to try to draw attention to the name of the publisher. So when you click on the install, that yellow box animates up and appears. Um, we had another condition that was similar, except instead of a yellow box, we decided to um, animate in the name of the publisher. Okay. 
And so while the animation is happening in this case, you can't actually install the software. You have to wait for it to finish. Okay. Then we had um, a condition where you actually have to swipe your mouse over the publisher name. So this was an attempt to get people to actually read the name of the publisher. So you, you have to take your mouse, swipe over before you're allowed to install. In some of the piloting, we discovered, though, that even doing that, people still weren't reading the name of the publisher. Um, so we, we decided to go a step further. And in this one, you have to actually type oh in the publisher name um, in order to do that. And we did have people who actually typed in Microsoft with two I's and zeros um, into the box. Um, but I assume that they, they did actually read it, but maybe they didn't process what they read. Okay. Um, <coughs> We also had some what we call composite attractors where we combined some of these things. Um, so we had the animated connector that animated it and then paused before you could actually install. Um, we also had one that had both the animated connector and the swipe. And then we had the animated connector and the reveal. So those three combinations. All right, so this was our whole list of, of different conditions that we ran. And um, to help, help uh, you keep track of them all, um, so the, the two on the top um, do not have anything to attract your attention to the publisher. So the short options and no AV. The rest of them are all what we call attractors. They all attract your attention to the publisher. Now of those, all except the ANSI one are what we call peril sensitive in that um, they, they attract your attention after you've tried to click the install button. If you just go ahead and click the don't install button, then it doesn't do any of that animation. It just lets you through. But if you try to click install, then they do something different. It's a peril sensitive. Um, now, some of them are also obstructive. So it turns out the animated connector one, you can actually go ahead and install while it's still animating. The rest of them, we actually locked it down. So until it had finished doing something, you couldn't install the software. So it was obstructive. Then we have some of them that had a forced action. So it wasn't enough to simply watch. You actually had to click on something or type something or do something before you could click install. And then we had our three composite um, tractors. So that's what we were testing. Um, we had a, a whole bunch of research questions. As you can imagine, with all these different conditions, there are many questions. But just to show you some of the high-level questions, um, we wanted to find out whether the attractors would actually help people notice the publisher names. Um, we wanted to know uh, which of the dialogues would result in the fewest installs in that suspicious condition. Um, we were also interested not only in the suspicious condition, but were people in the suspicious condition unknowingly in an uninformed way installing? Um, so it may be that we have people who saw that it was Microsoft with two eyes, but they knew it was a study and they wanted to see what, was ha what would happen and that's why they installed it. So we wanted to distinguish those people and really only count those who, who really fell for it, who didn't realize what was going on. Um, we were also interested in what happens in the case of the benign scenario. So this is a case that you know we don't want to stop people from drinking wine, right? We want people to be able to um, actually use their computer and do things with their computer if it's safe to do so. And so we want to make sure that our dialogues just don't stop everybody from doing everything. Um, we also want to make sure that, um, that when it's a benign situation, it doesn't take too much time in order to actually go ahead and install something. Um, and then we were also interested in whether um, sort of the more heavy handed we were with the design, whether we would get better results. Okay. All right, so how did we know whether users had noticed the publisher name? Um, we actually asked them after the fact if they could tell us the name of the publisher. Um, and so that, that helped us distinguish between those users who, um, who still had no idea and those who had noticed who the publisher was. Okay. Um, and so we have what we call the SSUI, Suspicious Scenario Uninformed Install Rate. So these were the people who installed the software in the suspicious scenario and did not know um, the name of the publisher. Okay, so most of our metrics are actually based on that SSUI rate. Um, we also looked at the benign, benign uh, scenario install rate and the benign scenario delay rate. Okay, so we had over 4,000 people begin the study. We had over 2,000 of them who actually encountered our security dialogue. 
Um, average age, 29 years, about half male. Um, took them about 17 um, minutes to complete the study, and we had users from Chrome, Firefox, and Internet Explorer. Okay, so in the benign scenario install rate, we actually found no significant differences. All right, so when it was safe, when it really was Microsoft, didn't really matter too much which dialogue you got. You were about 75% likely to go ahead and say uh, install. All right, as far as the time, there we did see some differences in the uh, benign scenario. You can see in the control condition, it took a lot less time than in the type condition because, you know, it takes a while to type stuff in. Um, we, it wasn't a huge time delay, you know, even in, in kind of the worst case, people were taking like 30 seconds, but um, if it happened frequently, taking that extra 30 seconds could be annoying. Okay, when we look at that suspicious scenario uninformed install rate, um, here you can see that um, most of the conditions look like they're doing better than the control condition. But let's dig a little bit deeper here. Right. If we look at those non-attractor conditions, just the no antivirus and the short options, it turns out that there's not statistically different from the control. Um, so just doing those wording changes doesn't actually have very much of an impact. Okay. When we look at the peril-sensitive attractors, we see that in these conditions, um, we actually do have a lot, they're doing a lot better than the control. Um, so, so there we have a statistical impact. So, so having a peril-sensitive attractor does make a difference. On the other hand, the ANSI condition, which is not peril-sensitive and is really kind of ugly, actually did almost as well as a bunch of these peril sensitive attractors, except for the type one where you actually have to type it in. That one does much better than ANSI. But ANSI is actually not, not doing statistically differently from the, from the peril sensitive attractors, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, we also found that the request condition, where we just asked people very politely to look at the publisher name, didn't do as well. Um, so it's not enough to ask them politely. Um, you do need to do, go out of your way even more than that uh, to get people to actually pay attention. Okay, so in conclusion, um, what we found from the study is that using attractors can actually reduce malicious install rates by up to 50%. Um, or at least the ones we tried. Um, we found that the simple changes, like uh, rewording, had very little impact. Um, but we did find that, um, that some of our attractors could have a very large impact. So where we had 51% of people um, who were installing the suspicious software in an uninformed way in the control condition, when we made them do the swipe, we had only 21%, and when we made them actually type the name of the publisher, only 8% uh, were, were uh, installing the suspicious software without knowing um, who it was from. Um, so we found that our most successful attractors were those that were both obstructive and forced in action. Um, unfortunately, they also introduced a delay in the benign scenario. Um, and our study really only had people do this once, and so we don't have a good handle of how it would work with um, habituation to these um, uh, new types of, of dialogues that people haven't seen before. And so that's something that we're going to be looking at in future work. All right, finally, um, so I'll wrap up uh, the contributions of this uh, work here. Um, so a big contribution was developing this web-based experimental platform that we used in both studies. Um, and there are a lot of other things that we think uh, can be done with this in order to study how people respond to various user interface components and operating systems um, uh, and, and can be administered remotely and with a web browser. Um, and then in our two studies, we tested user reaction to these specific password and warning dialogues. Um, we found that the spoof password entry dialogues do pose a significant risk. Um, we found the installation dialogues can be improved with attractors, especially those that are obstructive and force action. And we believe that the results from these studies are likely applicable to other types of security dialogues. And I'll take your questions. Yeah, the back. Um, have you guys, uh, are you familiar with like Daniel Kahneman's work? Like, uh, System 1, it's like psychology stuff? Yeah, yeah. Have you guys considered that, uh, the implications of that work with respect to your dialogue, for example? Like, typing might like wake you up a little bit, 
you know, so like maybe using a, a, any type of activity that would wake you up, you know, would that affect whether or not someone actually responds to the dialogue box or not? Have you like factored that into your work at all? Or? Yeah, so, so we've definitely thought about that. And that's why we tried different um, approaches that kind of force you to stop and think and um, and uh, so that we could see what would wake you up. And, and so we've seen that, you know, just asking politely, apparently that's that's not really actually getting into um, how people think at all. And so they, they can just kind of keep doing what they were doing. Um, seeing the um, that garish looking uh, window seemed to be waking people up a bit more, although there is the risk that the only reason it had that effect was because it's the first time they saw it. And maybe if that was the norm, um, that that they uh, would would be less likely to respond that way. But there may be other things that can be done um, as far as you know, making the type more difficult to read or things like that, that would slow people down and, and uh, wake them up. And so I, I think that those are you know, definitely interesting things that could be continued. I have a follow up question. Yeah. Um, so in his work, like basically when like you're more awake, awake and you have to do these tasks that are more uh, mentally taxing, that can make you fatigued, do you see you know, enhancing these warning dialogues as being at odds with usability? Oh, yeah, definitely. And, that, and that's why we were, um, you know, measuring what happens in the benign case. Um, you know, we, if we, we end up in a situation where people just can't use their computers to do anything, then that's not solving the problem either. Um, you know, we, we could lock down the computer and just not let you install anything, but we don't want to do that. And so that's why it's important to not just test the malicious case, but also test the benign case as well. Yes. I had a kind of a couple of questions. I think one latches onto him. Um, one was, you know, I know a lot of users sometimes are less aware of what's going on or awake, as he pointed out, um, when they're multitasking, if they're doing a couple other things at once. I mean, in this case, they're doing an Amazon study on games. Maybe they're listening to music or something, so they're not paying attention. Um, versus when you guys actually do it in a lab where they're in a controlled environment where they're focusing on one task at hand. Because I would think that, like, Besides gaming, you're also look, you know, gaming in this case, you're looking at people who are just in their offices daily and browse to a website and somehow, you know, get sidetracked by this but while they're working on other projects. So I wonder if, you know, there would be any difference there whenever you guys did your studies in the labs. And then also I wondered if um at least for the UAC for Windows, they always play that, you know, that sound, that beeping sound before that comes up. Did you guys simulate that as well or no, we didn't simulate the sound. Um, yeah. Um, uh, as far as the, you know, the difference between the lab and online. Yeah, I agree that um, using your own computer where you're doing a million other things uh, makes it much more realistic. And so um, we we hope that our online participants. Um, we're multitasking, and we believe that that's kind of the way a lot of Turkers work. They're people who um, may be actually at work and bored and doing MTurk or or doing multiple Turk experiments, you know, all at the same time or things like that. And so, so we're hoping that that the Turker environment does kind of replicate a, a true environment where people are multitasking. It's kind of a follow up too. I, you know, I've I've talked to friends about this for the longest time about things where, you know, you're asked to give administrator passwords to do certain functions. Do you think also that there's some consideration given when people are coding to maybe find uh, a means, at least with working with, you know, the, the OS manufacturers, for example, whether it's Apple or Microsoft in this case for the two most prominent, not, you know, counting all the Linux distros, about maybe finding ways of being able to s still use software without requiring that, that raised access to to do certain functions, whether it's updating the software itself or, um, you know, sometimes in some cases just even executing it will, will require, you know, administrator level access, which might not necessarily need to be granted for certain things like that. Yeah, well, so I think that definitely um, falls in line with the idea of, of removing the warnings by by removing the hazards. And I think to the extent that we can redesign our software systems so that we don't have to ask the user to do something that might be dangerous, then I think we're going to be better off. Um, because we, we've seen that even in our you know best solutions, we don't have 100% protection. So we, we need, we need uh, solutions that go beyond that. Yeah. Doesn't the idea of using an attractor imply that we're presenting too much information to the user initially? Uh, we're presenting too much information because the user can't tell where the key information is. That, yeah. 
Yeah, um, and and uh, definitely, if you, if you look at some of the warning dialogues out there, there's there's tons of information, um, uh, and we've tested some that have tons of information. For this study, uh, we we tried to really strip it down to kind of the bare essentials, so that that um, we could see. You know, is is the problem just that there are too many words, or is it that people don't know even with just a few words which ones to pay attention to? And so what we saw is that um, even com even with our very simple dialogue, um, compared to the control, having an attractor actually did make a difference. Um, and if I go back to the screen, um, it's there's not much you can do to remove too many more of these words. I mean, there, there are a few of these words that you, that you could make go and, you know, we, we've talked about it. Um, but, but if you want to actually ask the user a question and so that they know what they're answering, um, there's not that many you can remove. And in one of our conditions where we did remove some of them, it didn't help. Yeah, I guess what I was wondering is, does the user even care what the question is for? I mean, really what you want to know is, does the user trust Microsoft Corporation? So if you have like Microsoft Corporation, smiley face, frown face, you know, does that convey enough of the information? Well, no, it, it, it's, we don't want to know whether the user trusts Microsoft. We want, we want to know whether the user trusts the entity that's in the publisher line. Okay, and, and so, um, one of the things that you could do here is you could have a whitelist of trusted publishers. And if the publisher is on the whitelist of trusted publishers, then there's no need to pop this up at all. And that's actually something that we're starting to see happen. And so it's only those publishers that are not on the whitelist that we don't know what, you know, they're not on the whitelist, they're not on the blacklist, we don't know who they are. Now we have to have the user actually make a judgment. I guess what I'm getting at is that is the user basing the decision on on what you're trying to attract their attention to? I mean, are they actually reading allow the following publisher to install software? Because some of your results have suggested that the wording doesn't matter, so maybe they're they're just learning to ignore that completely. Yeah, um, it, we don't know whether they actually read what's in blue. Um, we we didn't uh, test it. Um, uh, we we have we have. Uh, hopes of um, someday doing a lab study with an eye tracker so we can see exactly what parts of the, of the warning people are reading. Um, so we don't know. Um, and we don't, so when we, we see that some of our attractors show an improvement, we, we can't say exactly why. And it may be that when they saw something suspicious, they then went and read what was in blue. Or it may be that they saw Microsoft with two eyes and go, ooh, that sounds kind of scary. I don't want to do that. We don't know. Wouldn't you have been able to tell with uh, how long they took on each dialogue? Like you guys probably had some sort of timing mechanism to see. So if they took, you know, five seconds versus they actually took, you know, 30 seconds, perhaps they actually were taking the time to, to read the entire dialogue as opposed to not? Yeah, so um, we do have that data, and um, I know Christian has looked at some of that data. Unfortunately, it's fairly noisy data because of the fact that people are probably multitasking, and so we we don't know exactly how long they were reading it versus it popped up on the screen, and then they noticed it was on the screen and, and things like that. And so that's going to be really hard to get at without doing a lab study, which has all the downsides of doing the lab study, and yeah. Yeah. How, how do you know uh, the users are not faking the like the date uh, the study? I mean, like they are just giving you what you want. Like, how would you like uh, differentiate between a legitimate flow and a non-legitimate flow? Like, just by seeing the data. Yeah. Well, so we, that that's difficult since we have never met these users. We don't know their names. We, you know, um, so that's why we tried to put in a few things uh, that would allow us to um, to see whether the user was genuine or not. Um, and so that's where, where, where we, you know, captured their password and then, you know, asked the questions about, are you going to let us keep this password or not? That was one of them. Um, you know, the, the test to see whether they were paying attention by asking what a power switch on a computer does. Um, and we have a number of open-ended um, questions. And if you look at the motivation of Turkers, they're mostly motivated to finish the hit and get paid. Um, the only reason that they would particularly want to please us is if they thought it would help them 
get paid more. So when you have an open-ended question and you ask people, you know, do you have any other comments about the study? They'll tend to write things like, oh, great study. I love your study, you know, things like that, because they think it will please us. Right? Um, but, but as far as um, trying taking the time to try to figure out exactly what it is that we're trying to do and trying to do that. Um, we, we designed the study in such a way that it would actually be a lot more work to a Turker to do that than it was probably worth. Now, are there a few in there who, who did figure it out and maybe they took the study, told their friend, told their friend to do it? Yeah, there probably are some in there. Um, we don't think that it's the, you know, the majority of them. So. Yeah. Um, have you considered changing the presentation of the publisher, for instance, not using text, using a logo or something? Because, for instance, in my experience, I've noticed that the text is usually not very helpful. For instance, let's say that you want to install Skype. You get a message that you should trust the publisher, Skype Technologies, S.A. So why should you trust this publisher? Maybe, you know, you should trust Skype Corporation or something else. So uh, do you have any ideas on that? Yeah, well, so so um, the specific name of the publisher in this case, um, uh, it, it is problematic in that people may or may not, you know, know know the, the publisher names. Um, and I think, as I said before, ultimately whitelisting well-known publishers um, is going to be a really useful thing here, so that um, you know Microsoft and Skype would all be whitelisted, and you would never have to actually see this for for those sorts of publishers, um, and. In, in, in doing this, this study, um, we, we had in mind that um, the, this attractor um, mechanism is not just for this particular dialogue, but in general what we're testing is whether the attractor can help uh, draw people's attention to the key bit of information. So you could have some other type of dialogue with some other type of information, and is this, is this actually going to help? But all of these techniques should really be used in conjunction with things like whitelisting and just trying to reduce the number of warnings that you actually need to show in the first place. Yeah? Um, I'm just not as familiar with how the publisher line is populated on these security dialogues, but um, if we were to use a whitelist or something like that, What's to say like a malicious group couldn't say I am Microsoft Corporation and then be whitelisted through? I mean, I'm I'm not just not familiar with how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I'm not um, that familiar either. But I know there's um, there's signed code um, that's being done here. So it's it's not actually the publisher saying that, but they actually have a key where they've been um, verified, and so it's it's the name that's associated with the key. Did I get it right, Christian? The, the actual X509 certificate. So uh, there are, you may, for example, take the name of the program, you may put whatever you want there, but not not the company name. That's something that, uh, I mean, nobody else but Microsoft can put Microsoft in, in there. There are some rules about that. It's not, it's not complete, it's not a guarantee, but there is some process in place. Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and end. If anybody else has questions, feel free to come up and talk to me.